The Fat Thing by Martin Waddell Old Mother Hubbard, caught in the cupboard, thought she was in for some fun. The fat thing was there, all flab and no hair, and Old Mother Hubbard got done. Something, some fat thing, minced her and munched her, chewed her and champed her, inwardly digested and spat out her bones like pips all over the clean tiles and the electric toaster. It made ever such a nasty mess in the kitchen, and didn't bother to eat her at the table, or use a knife and fork. Some fat things have no manners. That was the way Fred saw it, and he was the one who saw most of it, poor man. Fred Hubbard was her brother-in-law. Fred it was who came into the property, and Fred it was who had to clear up what was left of Minnie Hubbard out of the cupboard. Not to mention the scullery, and the bits that were choking up the backyard grating. He could have called in the GLC cleansing department, but he felt he owed at least a spot of Ajax to her memory. The sentiment was noble, but he regretted it when he got down to the job. He didn't much mind the gore sticking to the cauliflower or the way spare bits of intestine had got mixed up with the tapioca pudding. Fred was rather partial to tapioca himself, and, intrigued by the new mixture, he... Anyway, he could have put up with those horrors. It was a trail of bloody entrails down the hallway to the front door that gave Fred the quivers. It ran down the street outside for a few yards, and then disappeared abruptly, at the edge of a manhole cover. Obviously some fat thing had gone underground. Some fat Mrs. Minnie Hubbard eaten thing had eaten Mrs. Minnie Hubbard and got clean away with it. If clean is the word for a fat thing which drags its blood and entrail soiled self through a sewer in the lunch hour. Mind you, Fred had nothing against the fat thing. He was glad to be rid of Minnie. The fat thing was welcome to her, as far as Fred was concerned. Mrs. Minnie Hubbard, you see, wasn't all that enticing in life, and when life had departed she must have left a lot to be desired, even from a gastronomic point of view. In her prime she'd have been a meal fit for a... fit for a... she'd have been all right to eat in her prime, I expect, although she was inordinately fat, for she ate too many free steak burgers in the wimpy where she worked. But when her prime had bypassed her, poor Minnie went right off, not the bulk, there was still a lot of her, but the quality. She swept around in black tights, a purple smock and a bandolero, squeezing herself through the motions of a life she had quite outgrown, a gross elephant on the floor of the over forties club and a danger to traffic down the Mile End Road on Saturday nights. She was, in essence, a jelly-filled balloon of flesh, liberally coated inside with grease from her steak burger obsession. Greasy she was, horribly greasy. Grease wound up in driblets of fat when the fat thing was through with her. It chewed her up quite happily. That is what happened to Minnie Hubbard. And the end of the Minnie Hubbard bit of this story. Despite keeping a 24-hour watch on manholes all over London, the police were unable to catch the fat Mrs. Minnie Hubbard eaten thing, or the Mrs. Minnie Hubbard eaten fat thing. Put it whatever way you like. It adds up to the same fat thing. In the heart of a brooding city the police waited, their best brains glued to the ground, eager for a whisper of evil, or the rattle of a manhole cover in the night. When would the fat thing strike again? Only the fat thing knew. Alone in a dark steamy lair somewhere in the central London sewage system, cleverly disguised as central London sewage, the fat thing poured over a book of nursery rhymes, illustrated by Mabel Lucy Atwell. You may remember she drew fat little girls, did Mabel Lucy, and the fat thing was partial to fat. Little Bo Peep had lost her sleep. The fat thing came oozing behind her. It followed her home, where she lived all alone, and proceeded to mash and to grind her. Barbara Bo, or Pika Bo, to her friends, depending on their gender, lived in a tenement block in Wapping. She was a pub come club singer. She liked to sing Roses of Picardy, Yes We Have No Bananas, and God Save the Queen, though when she sang them they all sounded much the same. 
she had a great big belly, purple knickers, a piano accordion, and a little moustache. It was the belly which first attracted the fat thing as it oozed through the nightlife of Wapping. It was the belly, and perhaps something about the way she walked. She had a cumbersome gait which allowed mottled flesh to slurp over the tops of her thigh-high black leather boots with the Lone Ranger studs, to slurp over the top and slap against her miniskirt, in effect almost a rumba rhythm. The fat thing approved of her appearance from the blonde hair to the faint speckling of cigarette ash which turned her little black outfit silver grey. The fat thing, I can only suppose, wasn't all that discerning. It had been too long in its sewer. It felt like some fresh air and a good square meal. And you can't get much squarer than, yes we have no bananas, can you? As she hurried through the dimly lit streets of Wapping, Bo somehow sensed that something incredibly old, something from the foul primeval swamps of prehistory, lurked in the darkness watching her, furtively slurping betimes. She can scarcely have heard the fat thing, for though it made sloppy slippy noises as it oozed along, it did its level best to ooze quietly, being well aware that sloppy slurpy slippiness is often defined as antisocial by people who have ordinary legs. Bo turned her head now and then anxiously, but she could see nothing peculiar. As we know, the fat thing was oozing right behind her, but she couldn't see it. She had been in a lot of bee pictures. Slurp it went, and oozed over a milk bottle that happened to be in the way. It didn't say slurp, that was the noise it made when it slopped down onto the pavement. She turned quickly, all a quiver. In the distance she could see a milk float and two charwomen in their fur coats. Closer still was a large man with a rubbery face, all wrapped up in an overcoat, but there was nothing about him to suggest slurping, beyond a faint air of acquaintance with primeval swamps. It cannot be him, she said. He. How wrong she was. It could be him. He. And it was. She would have seen the truth about the rubber-faced man immediately if she had been walking behind him, for, instead of footprints in the snow, there was snow. I left that bit out in the first graphic bit of scene setting. But there was snow. Instead of footprints in the snow, the rubber-faced man left behind a trail of slime and ooze which was later to lead the police to a manhole cover in Leiterman's entry, where it ended abruptly with, I think it is safe to assume, a splash. Or should it be slop? These sound effects are very difficult to convey. Why did the man with the rubber face leave a trail of slime and ooze and other unmentionables behind him instead of footprints in the snow. Because he was no ordinary rubber-faced man, but that very incredibly old something from the foul primeval swamps of prehistory, which she had expected to see when first she heard him slopping about. Bo almost guessed it, but not quite. Coincidence being what it is, at that very moment, Fred went by in a stolen motor car. If this were real life, Fred would have spotted the foul trail of slime and ooze the rubber-faced man left behind him and made straight for the police station. But Fred was driving a stolen car and had no wish to have many regurgitated all over his clean tiles, so he drove on whistling and never said a word. It started as a bad smell in the drains opposite numbers 224 to 386 in the flats. Then the drains became blocked, and little bits of bow came bubbling up in the gent's convenience in Flotilla Street. Whatever bit of bow it was that they uncovered, when at last the courtyard flags were lifted, it was certainly disgusting. Something like paper mashy blended here and there with porridge, with just a dash of sarsaparilla. There was a lot more of it in flat 248, blocking up the plug hole. Every flat these days should have basic amenities. Indoor lavatory, larder and bath. Bo's flat, 24A, had the larder and lavatory, but not the bath. Bo took a bath every second Thursday in a wooden tub she'd brought up from her mum's house in Brixton. She liked to put it by the fire, so she could watch television and soap herself at the same time. The fat thing had made a mistake. It had put Bo's wooden tub on top of her gas cooker, 
and what was left of Bo in it, presumably with Bo broth in mind. But the tub, being wooden, had caught fire, and the fat thing's broth was spoilt. So it put a little of the unburnt Bo in a pot with spices and flour, and a little garlic and some well-whipped eggs, and produced a sort of a stew. It had an overall sickly red stickiness, and a great deal of body. The curious thing about it all was that the neighbours didn't take the stew for Bo at first. They were downtrodden, and very short of food, so that when they discovered that Bo had gone off on her holidays, leaving a good stew to go to waste, they sent their little ones round in relays with plastic buckets to fetch it. There were some splendid meals in Honigman's tenement that night. Many a pale child savoured little bits of stewed bow before Mr. Feldman found the, the, the piece of bow's anatomy that he found. It was very wet and not at all firm, set in a wedge of egg and sausage meat, and ever so faintly toasted. It must have been in the original bow broth, to begin with. It was ever so faintly toasted, but it was still a... Uh, a... Uh, well, it was. He finished up his stew, wiping round the plate with a piece of bread, and rang the police afterwards. After all, he was hungry, and he was a Chinese, despite being called Feldman. He could remember the bad old days in the old country. The news unglued the police brains pretty quickly, I can tell you. They took away what was left of the bow broth and the bow stew, and tried to put the bits they could identify together again. But it proved to be a quite impossible task. The fat thing had oozed again. All of London rose in horror. Terror stalked the night-long streets, lit up only by purple prose. Men with the merest primeval swamp look about them were stoned in Madame Tussauds. Through the darkness of the sewers, the fat thing oozed on with a contented belly, if you can call it a belly. We are fast approaching a difficulty in the story of the fearful fat thing. A difficulty which can best be explained away by the revelations contained in part three of this tale. The fat thing eats Jack Horner. Little Jack Horner sat in a corner, watching his guest on the sly. The fat thing betrayed him. It stuffed him and spayed him, and put what was left in a pie. Jack Horner was a rotten no-good layabout from Harrow and King's College, Cambridge. He had been brought up by a loving old auntie and given every opportunity, but he had gone to the bad. This is a bit of character stuff put in to provoke sympathy for the fat thing, who was also an orphan. Jack had lost his parents in 1929 when they fell off the gold standard and, on the day he met his death, had a damn good job as a bus inspector with London Transport which was more than he deserved. At half past eight that fateful evening, Jack was in his front room, counting the matchbox labels he had stolen from his blind twin sister Mabel, when he heard a soft, oozy knock at the door. He should have been suspicious about soft, oozy knocks, after what had happened to other gross people with nursery rhyme names, but he was not. Jack refused to pay for newspapers, and his television had been taken back by the finance company, so he knew nothing of the rhyme and crime. Good evening said the man with the rubber face when Jack answered the door. I believe you let furnished apartments. Jack didn't, but he was always glad to be in on a good thing. Sixteen guineas a week and no questions asked, he snapped, his treble chin quivering with emotion. It may have been coronation week, but sixteen guineas was still overcharging. Done, said the rubber-faced man, feeling Jack's flabby forearm with his fingers. Come upstairs, said Jack, his chubby face beaming. I'll show you to your room. The rubber-faced man followed him upstairs, carrying only a large suitcase which contained flour, vanilla flavouring, sausage meat and raspberries, mingled with some dodgy things from the sewer. This will suit splendidly, said the rubber-faced man, easing himself down onto the rickety bed with only the faintest of slurp sounds. Give me my money, said Jack, and the rubber-faced man did. When Jack had gone, the rubber-faced man pulled the curtains and switched off the light. Then he felt for the zip on his body stocking, 
and tugged it down. As the rubber skin of the rubber-faced man slipped off, the fat thing stood revealed in its awful corsets. Corsets? Why corsets? It needed corsets because it wasn't man-shaped in the least. It was thing-shaped, shapeless. When the corsets came off, it collapsed, quivering on the floor. A mound of pale, hairless, breathing flesh, all stale and pulpy, sweating and oozing as its suckers sucked the carpet, drawing it across the floor to the doorway, which it oozed through, before welling down the stairs, slurping from step to step with the suitcase full of cooking ingredients, contained in a handy sack in its intestines. No pets allowed, cried Jack, who was sitting by his one-bar electric fire. They were his last words. The fat thing oozed over his armchair, formed a jack-shaped hump over him, flopped across his nostrils, swelled over his mouth and eyes, flesh to flesh, pale sticky flesh to flesh, sucked and scraped, oozed and embraced, drowned and smothered him before it dragged him in a fleshy bundle to the floor and set off for the back kitchen where it... There can really be no excuse for continuing any further with this story, which is most objectionable. Jack went the way of the rest, amid incredible slime and gore. The only reason for including Jack at all was to explain the bit about the belly. In a sense, you see, the fat thing was all belly, inside and out, greasy, all-embracing, hungry belly, a belly with no mouth, but infinite flexibility. Whatever it slithered around was suddenly inside it, all sucked up in its digestive juices. Isn't it wonderful how, when I've got this corset on and my rubber body stocking over it, I can get my fingers, fingers, sufficiently firm to type out this manuscript and send it to a publisher? They say there's a book in everyone, even primeval fat things. Don't think too badly of me. Fat things have to live, you know. Fat doesn't grow on trees. It grows on people. 